everyone. Hey, what's up? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Roll Pod, an Alabama sports podcast from Bama 247. I'm Cody Goodwin, sick of false start penalties, and joining me today to recap Alabama's 26 to 20 win over Texas A&M is 247 Sports senior writer John Talty. John, um, cracking jokes about false starts because that crowd at Kyle Field was um, it was awesome. If you love college football, and we all love college football, but clearly impacted Alabama in various capacities. And yet they still found a way to come out with a win. Um, kind of fun, kind of uh entertaining game um for the most part. Um, we're gonna recap the game. Um yeah, I don't exactly know where to start except right at the top there. First, uh, what were your initial thoughts from this game, John? I know you wrote that um, you know, this Alabama team's more or less gonna be a roller coaster this season. Is that still the takeaway a few days later, or, or what what are you thinking after this performance? Yeah, I think that's that was kind of my initial feeling. And I think it starts with, you know, Jalen Milrow, I think is kind of the, you know, a good example that illustrates that in which he'll do things that I think are really incredible. And I think he'll do things that are like, why did you do that? And I think that's kind of the reaction you have, at least for me, watching this Alabama team that from play to play there's not always a lot of consistency from play to play it can be great to bad and i think it's unique for a nick saban led team to kind of look this way and i think what it is for a lot of us i mean especially i think maybe for you cody like there are a lot of teams that look like this it's just that for alabama they don't look like this typically that i think is throwing people for a loop that they're not used to the wild ups and downs um, that that so many of other college football programs and college football fans deal with. So for me, I think, you know, we're at the midway point of the season. This is a team that clearly can still compete for, you know, the highest goals that they want. I think there's still the floor is probably not um, as hot. I think the floor still could be lower than people would want. Uh, so it's just, it's interesting. I think there's a wide range of variables and possibilities more so than I can remember in a long time for an Alabama team. Yeah, I think that that's kind of my prevailing takeaway, maybe just, you know, through a different lens that just like this team is there's there's an element of unpredictability, probably more so with the offense than the defense. And and we'll touch on that here. Um, but that kind of I, it makes it entertaining. It makes it kind of fun. I know Alabama fans are, you know, used to just like 45 to seven curb stompings over teams that they should curb stomp on a regular basis or, um, you know, they're just used to a level of consistency um that they just don't seem to have this year um again at least offensively and i think I, you made a good point to just kind of you know maybe a little bit of a reflection of the starting quarterback Jalen milro can he's got high highs and he's got some like frustrating I, I wouldn't even call them lows just like you know not always consistently at that high level of play all the time um but it makes it entertaining. Like I, one of the beauties of college football, I think at least is that there's, you never really know how many good teams there are in a given year. And what makes it fun is that there's like, you know, 160 some teams um, that people regularly pay attention to. I know there's significantly more than that, but just there's always a handful that are good. And then the rest of them are just kind of this sloppy mess. And, you know, if the good teams aren't good on a given day, the teams that are kind of mixed into that sloppy mess can, you know, pull an upset. I mean, we saw a little bit of it. Georgia Tech, I know, is a pretty good team, but they, you know, found a way to beat Miami. It was probably more Miami's fault than Georgia Tech being, you know, on a really, really good day. But, you know, we almost saw Arizona almost pulled out against USC. And, you know, not that this game was in that category, but, you know, I think Alabama's closer to the sloppy mess than maybe they've been in years past, at least from my perspective. Um, you know, because I just, you know, coming down here and watching them from afar, they're just they're they're the big bad kings of the SEC. They're, they're it's a well oiled machine. And, you know, it's still, you know, a very, very good football team. Like it's still a machine, especially defensively. But just I guess just it's not as well oiled as it has been in years past, which there's an element of entertainment that kind of comes with that. Um, you know, and I think you hit on it pretty well in your post game column, like buckle up and enjoy the ride a little bit. It's going to be something of a roller coaster game to game. And Alabama fans may not like that, but, you know, I go into every game just hoping to be entertained in some capacity and they can check that box from Saturday. Yeah. And I, I think it's, you know, some of the responses to that were kind of funny. They're like, I, I don't want, you know, excitement. I want like 
boring murder ball in which we dominate. It's like, yeah, I get it. You know, I know all the fans, that's what they want. That's the expectation. And so it's, it's going to take them some, I think, getting used to of this team. Um, but you're right. I think that there's been a lot of talk about parody in college football this year. And I think that there is some truth to it. Now I will say also Georgia looks like the top team in the country right now. And so I don't know if there's really that much of a shakeup, but I do think that the talent, um, through NIL and transfer portal and some other things is a bit more dispersed now. And so I think the, the massive talent differential is not quite there as much. I think it is still for some teams, obviously, I, you know, when we see Alabama take on Arkansas this weekend, like there's a pretty big talent differential there, but in general, I think it's gotten smaller than maybe what we saw in some of these early dominant Nick Saban, Alabama teams. And so that margin of error has gotten smaller. And I, I can really remember noticing it in 2021 where Alabama just, I mean, they had to just battle out games and they did not always look very good doing it. And you could just tell, all right, this team is just not quite as dominant. And they still were able to find a way to make it to a national championship game and had a very good shot to win that game, you know, winning in the fourth quarter before ultimately losing to Georgia. So there, there is a path here for these teams. And I think we're just seeing, again, there's just not quite as many dominant dominant teams georgia i think was a dominant team in the last couple of years but big picture wise there's there's like you said I think there's more more of the kind of in the middle mess of on any given day can take a swing and win versus just those teams that are just so far and away better than everybody else the way that alabama used to be we were talking about this leaving kyle field on saturday um this would be a great year for a 12 team playoff um yeah. you know it, it doesn't start until next year but man this this would be a really fun year especially with you know, I know that they've been talking about having at least the first round, maybe the first couple rounds on college campuses like that would be, you know, really, really fun. Because I think if you use the AP poll right now, Alabama's the 10 seed, So they would play number or I guess the 11 seed. They would play, you know, number six. I guess I'll pull up the AP poll. Um, you know, they would open against. Do quick math here. They would open against uh, Penn State. Right. So like that would be that would That's be kind of fun. Great. Right. Because Yeah. So, you know, and then the winner of that one would go to Ohio State. So, like, that's that'd be kind of fun, right? And, you know, we got one more year of the 14 playoff, but just given how, I don't know, weird, how just, I guess, the the top teams, the top tier teams seem to be a little bit closer together in terms of talent gap. um, This would be a really fun year for a 12 team playoff. Alabama 26 10 winners over AM trailed 17 10 at half. Um, had a really rough second quarter as AM surged. Second half defense played virtually lights out um, against AM. Third quarter is when Alabama's offense found its groove a little bit. Jalen Milrow finished the game 21 of 33, 321 yards, three touchdowns. Um, Jermaine Burton finally exploded. He played nine snaps. Last week against Mississippi State, this week, nine catches, 197 yards, two touchdowns on 13 targets. Isaiah Bond, seven catches, 96 yards, and a touchdown. Um, overall offensive performance, not again, not, not the most efficient offensive performance, but they clearly came in with a game plan. I felt like they executed that game plan. What was one thing you liked about the way Alabama played offense on Saturday? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to start the passing game. You know, I think it was clearly effective. Uh, I think they knew that there was – a liability there from Texas A&M's defensive secondary, and I think they went and attacked it. I liked that they were aggressive early on, taking shots. You know, I thought that was smart, and I think eventually, you know, they started obviously hitting really in the third quarter. But I think the combination of the guys you mentioned there, Milrow, Burton, Bond, I would say especially Burton, I think, you know, I'm curious to see how much of that can carry over week to week. But, you know, he, I think, has emerged as – the number one guy right now, at least. And if he can consistent now, he's not always going to do nine uh, catches and two touchdowns, but if he can be more consistent, if he can get open more moving forward, I think that really helps Jalen Milrow and what they're able to do in the passing game. So I was very impressed by him. You know, he had that early unsportsmanlike penalty and you're kind of like, Oh man, what is Burton doing here? But then he just absolutely delivered. And, you know, again, there was also one where, you know, he was open a couple of times where Miller missed them and it could have been a big play or touchdown too. So he had just, I thought a great game. And I think Jalen overall was, was very good. Now, did he make some mistakes? Absolutely. The interception was really bad. Uh, took some sacks that I think were on him more than the offensive line. And, uh, you know, I was down on the field for it. So I don't 
think I got the greatest, you know, vantage point of it. But and I know that you rewatched the game, so you saw it. But the decision to throw on first down uh, in the fourth quarter late in the game, from you know, I feel like when we were talking about it after the game, it seems like Nick Saban was uh, was pretty upset about that. So still some questions on some of the decision making I think that he makes. But big picture wise, like he delivered. I think it's his best game that he's had at Alabama. You know, obviously it was more than 300 yards passing and they, they, they did what they needed to. And I think that's something that certainly is encouraging. I think if you're an Alabama fan moving forward, that Milrow and Burton and Bond and others can put up performances like that in a tough road environment to be able to steal a win. Yeah. Um, I liked that. I mean, it, the rewatch on that fun, and you know, I guess we'll see what, what Saban says, but best of my knowledge, um, you know, that, that play, that fourth down play or not the fourth down play, the first down play that came after the fourth down play, right. Cause they converted, um, to Jason McClellan, um, best of my knowledge, that play where they moved the chains, um, McClellan like went down cause like Milrow was under pressure. He kind of threw the ball off his back foot. Uh, McClellan started the catch process with a knee on the ground and then he didn't gain control of it um until like a split second into it but in the midst of that he picked his knee up off the ground and then turn and ran and converted um and so i wonder if it was just kind of like in their head a little bit that you know oh his knee was down like we need to run a play real quick so that they right. can't review it um you know and then it ended up being an incomplete pass whereas like you know and it's a hard thing to do in the moment but like instead of like throwing an incomplete pass like just take the snap and take a knee so that you can get the playoff and the clock right. can still run right because then you don't right. have to worry about you know throwing the ball a mile into the air to kill off the final seven seconds of the game but best of my knowledge that was the only one that made sense but yeah no i agree milro fantastic um first career 300 yard passing game um I, the thing I liked, which kind of played into this a little bit, is that Alabama basically, like, the game plan was so fascinating to me because it went basically against everything Nick Saban wants out of this offense this year. Like, he wants a run-first operation, wants to be able to play action. He does want to be able to drop back and throw when they need to, but, like, not – that doesn't want to be the first option. This game, it was very much the first option, right? Like, yep. they had 39 total dropbacks. Um, and the other interesting part about this, obviously, is that AM's pass rush – very, very good, right? They came into this game with 20 sacks. They finished the game with six sacks, but Saban basically bet on his guys and said, like, look, we're probably going to give up some plays, but we, if we can hit on enough of them. Um, we can probably make some plays, right, and take advantage of a and secondary. And, they, you know, Milrow had eight completions that went 15-plus yards. He went six of eight for 200 yards on passes that went 20-plus uh, yards downfield, so six for eight, 200 believe two touchdowns he was blitzed on 25 of the 39 dropbacks um and he went 14 for 20 for 245 and two touchdowns in those situations um you know he not a lot of big plays in the running game but you know jace mcclellan had a 15 yarder on a first down that sparked a touchdown drive milro had a 12 yard run on a first on the first play of another touchdown drive um you know so they they were able to find some chunk yardage here and there i think that was 10 total big plays in the game um, yeah, you mentioned the interception in the rewatch, like the play was there, you know, cause like it was play action, Amari and I black runs up field. And it's one of those plays that we see Bryce make all the time. Mac Jones made it all the time. Uh, you know, Tua and Jalen hurts obviously made this play all the time, but you, the, the window was there to throw it. Milro just kind of waited a tick too long. And yeah. then when he threw it, he threw one of those floaters that you and I complain about every single game. Yeah. And Bryce Anderson was just like, he read his eyes the entire way and just jumped the route. Yep. Um, I feel like if Milro pulls the trigger or throws that ball with some zip, it could be a really, really big play because there wasn't anybody behind Anderson. So Nyblack's a big enough body that you just, you wonder how that matchup goes. Um, no, I thought Milro played really well. I think the most encouraging part was that Alabama really, I, again, like you mentioned, we got to see how this goes, but they, they figured out who their top receivers are and they leaned on those guys for the majority of the game. I think one thing that's been really confusing is just the, the way that they've used all their receivers so far this year in this game, uh, Malik Benson played 40 snaps. He think he only caught like one pass, but Jermaine Burton played 40 snaps, obviously had 13 targets. Isaiah bond played 36 snaps after those three, Jalen Hale played 11 snaps. Kobe Prentice played nine snaps. Kendrick Law played six, six snaps. Like, they very much, like, these are our three guys in this game. We're going to lean on them. And the passing office, I think, benefited from that a little bit. Um, clearly, Burton had a big game. Bond had a big game with a 52-yard touchdown reception. 
Um, it was just nice to see them settle on a group of receivers and just be like, yep, these are our guys. They're going to play 80 to 85% of the snaps. Um, and I think that helped Jalen Milrow quite a bit. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, what was one thing you did not like about the way Alabama played offense? Well, I mean, I think the running game is an obvious one. You know, I think that, like you mentioned, I think you mentioned probably the two positive running plays that they had and the rest were bad. Um, I think, you know, you can look at the total number 23 yards, which obviously is impacted based on sacks and things like that. So it looks even worse than it is. But I mean, it was, I think it was a combination of them realizing they couldn't run and knowing coming in, they probably weren't going to be able to run that well. So you have to take that into account. But, you know, I, I think we've talked about it over the course of the season and that, you know, even games like Mississippi State where it's much more run heavy, like this is just not to me the, you know, certainly not the best Alabama running approach I've seen. You know, I, I think that they have some guys who can do some things in various moments, whether it's Jace, Rydell. Um, I think we saw a little jam um, against a and I don't think there's a clear, this is a no doubt great running back of that group. I think they're all pretty good. And so there's a rotation. There's going to be a little bit of kind of, you know, riding the hot hand, I think at times, but you know, I think that that is going to be a challenge. Like you said, if that's the way that Nick Saban wants to play and you can't trust your, your running backs to, to deliver, then it puts more pressure on, on Jalen. I'm curious to see how that approach shifts against Arkansas this week and what they're able to do uh, on the ground. But, you know, I think some combination of the running game and, you know, just the entire offensive line at times, you know, I mean, nine false start penalties. Uh, you mentioned the six sacks, the inability to create running holes. Yeah. I think that group is, there are parts of it that have improved and there are parts of it that are still, this group is just not what we thought it was. And I think that's as more and more time goes on, I think that's where I fall on it, but they're also still, you know, again, we're six games in and they're still, moving guys around and shifting guys around and, you know, Nick Saban cited injuries, which I'm sure plays a role, but there's still, you know, it doesn't seem like that group is locked in yet. And that's, you know, I think that is going to be one of the bigger questions for me moving forward. Yeah. They, I, the one thing I didn't like was just all the freaking pre-snap penalties, um, just nine pre-snap penalties out of 14. So you had eight false starts and an illegal snap, which I think goes on the books as a false start, but you know, all every offensive lineman except for Tyler Booker was flagged for a false start. Um, you know, tight end CJ Dupre got flagged for a false start twice. So did Jermaine Burton literally on the first play of scrimmage for Alabama's offense. Um, not great. Can't do that. Um, you know, I, in addition to that kind of tangentially related, there's six touchdowns now that Alabama's had called back this season because of a penalty. Um, you know, we can debate the merits of Dallas Turner's blindside block. I didn't think it was so much a blindside and I thought it was just more, you could argue incidental contact. You could argue that a different officiating crew, um, you know, probably wouldn't have called it. But like, you know, when Braswell's streaking down the sideline and you're 20, 15, 20 yards behind the play, like, don't don't do that. You know, right. just like little stuff. Um, but no, regarding the offensive line, like, you know, people are going to look at the 26 sacks allowed in six games. And yes, that's horrible. Like there are only two teams in the country that have allowed more sacks than Alabama, um, Colorado, 31 and Old Dominion, 32. So, like, not great. Um, that said... Not like, great, Bob. Not not great at all. Like, not, not even a little bit. But, um, you know, one of the things that I've started to really pay closer attention to is, like, are all of these sacks the offensive line's fault? Sure. And I would argue that in recent weeks, no, they haven't been. Um, now, th that doesn't... That's not me saying the offensive line has played great. Um, they've had good moments, but it, like you said, it's not this elite group that they build themselves to be in the preseason. And, you know, but like that's Milrow's not helping himself on occasion. Um, you know, every now and again, like they'll, they'll load up with 12 personnel, the tight ends sometimes miss blocks, uh, the running backs occasionally miss blocks in the case of A&M. Like they just, they sent constant pressure all game. Like there were some times where it's just, you got five or six guys and they send six or seven and it's yep. just like. OK, can everybody get a hat on a hat or did they run their stunts correctly or, you know, like very first sack of the game? Like, I think it was just the spy chasing Milrow down after he bailed on the pocket. So, you know, not all of these are on the offensive line, for sure. um, you know, so that's you know, that's I think that's maybe the next evolution for a Jalen Milrow. Like, dude, like you need to stop stepping into bad situations 
Um, those are hard film lessons to learn, especially after you've taken as many hits and sacks as you have through the first few weeks. Um, you know, but I think I, one thing I, I like about pro football focus, and again, we can debate the merits of this is that they assign who allowed the sacks and who allowed the pressures. Um, a and M finished with six sacks and 16 pressures against Alabama. Only two of those sacks and six of those pressures were assigned to the offensive line. So a lot of that was a and M just you know, hounding them with pressure. And we yeah. saw that a lot, especially in the second quarter, right? Like combination of penalties and AM just teeing off on them, right? I think three possessions in a row ended with a third down penalty followed by a sack. Um, that can't happen, but that's, I don't know that that's all on the offensive line. Um, you know, so that's, you know, when Saban talks about, you know, and, and we kind of roll our eyes and it's maybe a little bit of coach speak, but like all of the elements playing together, offensively, you know, the, the receivers getting open on time, the quarterback getting the ball out on time, you know, the offensive line doing enough to protect, like that's, this is what he means. Like not all of these sacks are on the offensive line, um, you know, but like Milrow can't give up sacks in certain situations. You know, the running backs and the tight ends have to pass block a little bit better. Like there's just, it's, it's a situational awareness for everybody involved. Um, you know, cause like, you know, six sacks, but like, thought the offensive line played okay. Not great, but I thought they played okay. They clearly did enough to set up some of the bigger plays. Yeah, I mean, I just think the combination of that plus the penalties is just hard to give that group a a, a good grade um, for me. Yeah, I wouldn't give them I, the most generous, maybe a B minus. So I would say C at best, honestly. You're more you're more positive than I am, I guess. I just, you know, I, I think the guy who I maybe would give the best, I think Latham was the best, and I think, Roberts showed me some things that I think could make that unit better. Booker, you mentioned, didn't really have a penalty. I think, you know, Seth McLaughlin, I, I just, I still don't really know what's going on there. I just, I think he's been probably the biggest disappointment on that offensive line so far. I just, you know, the fact that there's still snap issues and things like that, it's just, it's kind of boggling the mind. And I think that hit, I think, um, and maybe you noticed this in your rewatch, I think some of those false start penalties were on Seth, really, of like just the timing not being right and guys, you know, being off because of that. So I think that's a that's an issue. But, you know, we'll see if they clean it up. Yeah, I think there was there was an element too. I mean, and they Alabama tried to beat the noise by, you know, Book would tap Seth, yep. you know, and that was kind of the cue to snap the ball, you know, because I think they were they were trying to get a lot of calls in and protection calls in from the sideline. And so, you know, Booker would make a lot of those calls at the line because I don't know that they could hear Milrow. But I think a lot of the, you know, like Pritchett and Proctor, for example, were both tagged for false starts. And I think they were trying to match the the shoulder tap with the snap. Um, you know, so they both jumped early on those cases. Roberts. Yeah, Ro I thought Roberts played pretty well. He ultimately allowed a sack um, and he got tagged for back to back false starts, I think, in the fourth quarter. But otherwise, that like, bad. yeah, that was bad. But like outside of that, you know, he didn't again, I'm not the foremost offensive line expert, but he didn't look like a liability for most of the game. Yeah. Um, you know, so that was, I thought that was encouraging, but yeah, no, the combination of, you know, the, the, the penalties and really the, the run blocking is just not there. Um, I agree with you there that that's just, that's not good. Um, defensively, um, this Alabama defense continues to put championship caliber behavior on tape. Um, they only allowed 306 yards after halftime. They only allowed 103 yards. They only allowed three points in the second half. They racked up five of their own sacks, six tackles for loss. It was a big, big game from the defensive line. You look at Alabama's tackle leaders, Tim Keenan, eight, eight tackles, a sack, a tackle for loss. Um, Deontay Lawson came back, played all 64 um, defensive snaps, had five tackles, had a pass breakup. Justin Aboigby had a sack and a half. Um, QB hit, five tackles. Jaheim Otis, four tackles and a half sack. Tim Smith had three tackles. Obviously, Turner and Braswell did their thing. Um, what was one thing you liked about the way that the defense played? It's hard to pick just one, you know. Um, and I don't want to steal uh, steal your thunder because I know what your favorite one is, just how much you were raving about it when we are uh, <laughs> eating dinner after the game. So I'll let you have that one. But, you know, I think I'll say big picture-wise, I think just the – how they made Max Johnson's life uncomfortable in that game. You know, I think it was a combination of different people, Dallas Turner, Braswell, you mentioned a bunch of the defensive linemen there. Uh, they just, I mean, that guy, that dude was just taking shots all day. And I actually give Max Johnson a lot of credit. I mean, I think he's a gritty dude because, I, you know, he was taking 
big licks and he kept getting back up and delivering but that defense is it's a salty group and i think that they are you can trust them i mean this is there were some real dudes on this a&m offense especially at the wide receiver position and and they were going after kool-aid a bit and you know they got some plays off of him but overall that secondary you know was was really good i thought uh your guy Terion had a, a really important you know breakup of what i think was either about to be a touchdown or very close to being a touchdown just a group that i think is just there's not one massive weakness i think and they like you said i think they allow you to stay in games and this team when we think about the big picture potential of it, a lot of that I think is drawn from the defense and what we think they're capable of do capable of doing each week. And so I don't think there was anything that shocked me about what they did. I mean, I think this is what we kind of expect out of them week in and week out, but I guess just the thing that impressed me the most was I think just how effective the pass rush was and just how, I mean, they were, it was a more aggressive, I think game plan than maybe what we've seen a bit too. I think Kevin Steele was dialing up some interesting stuff, but I just think that Braswell, Turner, other guys, I, I just, you know, I was impressed by how much they impacted Max Johnson and ultimately played a big role, I think, in, in winning the game. Yeah, they they didn't have to blitz a ton, but they kind of varied where the pressure came from. Like there were a couple right. of times where Braswell maybe dropped back or Turner dropped back and they allowed, you know, Tresman Marshall to kind of get in the mix in the middle. Um you know, they the the defensive line, I thought, played a really, really good game. They got a ton of push up front. Um, you know, you look at some of the the obviously there's the, the tackle numbers, but you look at some of maybe the advanced stats. Um, Turner and Braswell obviously did their thing, but like Justin Aboigby finished with four pressures. Um, Tim Keenan added two more. Otis and Tim Smith and even Jamarian Latham in limited snaps. Uh, produced a lot of really, really good plays and just were able to get to the quarterback. This was kind of this was an interesting matchup because it was it was offenses that were not the same, but they were dealing with the same problem. Like we talked, you know, a lot about AM's ability to bring pressure. Alabama can do that just the same, uh, maybe yeah. not in the same way, right? Where they kind of put six guys on the line and make you guess where they're coming from. But like, you know, it's going to be Turner and Braswell. And they just, I mean, they crushed it all game. I think they combined for 14 pressures. Um, they, it, it was impressive. It was really impressive. I, you know, obviously after the, uh, you know, on the safety, for example, right? They punt it. A&M's got the ball at what the 15 or 16 yard line and just, you know, Keenan and Otis combine on a sack and then a Boyd B forces the safety like back to back plays to not ice the game, but, you know, put Pretty it. Much. Yeah. Like in hindsight, yeah, ice the game, but, you know, just really impressive. I thought from the D line. Yeah. The one thing I liked, um, shout out Caleb Downs, man. That was, I was raving about the pick because that was just awesome, you know, and that there was a lot of things kind of in tandem on that play, right? They sent, Tresman Marshall up the middle. He beat the running back who was pass protecting. And they, you know, like you mentioned, Max Johnson spent a lot of this game backpedaling. Um, this play in particular, he was backpedaling again, um, threw it off his back foot. It was maybe a little bit behind the tight end, but Downs read it the whole way, made a jump, um, you know, recorded the pick. Um, I think I said this when we were walking out of Kyle Field, like, you know, an average DB probably causes enough incidental contact for an incomplete pass. A good DB gets his hands on it for the pass breakup, but like uh, blue chip players make blue chip plays. Like I'm not sure how many DBs, you know, fully able to, you know, not only get there to meet for the coverage, but also can jump the route and score the pick. Um, that was huge. That was even Nick Saban said that that kind of changed the momentum of the game a little bit. For sure. um, so that was impressive. But then I, th you know, in the rewatch, the other thing that I was thinking about, um, you know, fourth quarter, Anaya Smith has that 37 yard catch and run down the sideline where it's initially ruled a touchdown. Um, you know, but then on review, they, they, you know, he stepped out of bounds. That was Caleb Downs again, man. Like he, the hustle play to get down there um, against a guy who's wicked fast at full sprint um, to push him out of bounds or at least push him enough that he steps out of bounds. Like that was a huge play in the course of the game. Like, think about it. Like if Smith scores there, it's 26, 24, Alabama, 316 left. Alabama's three previous drives to that point, like 14 total yards on nine plays. It included a fumble. They punted twice. AM would have had all three timeouts. Like in hindsight, probably not a good thing. Instead, um, Alabama's defense forced AM to bleed basically another minute off the clock. Aggies had to call a timeout. They settled for a field goal. They punted the ball, or I guess they did the onside kick. Alabama recovered and ultimately milked the clock all the way down. Like that was a huge play in the grand scheme of things, considering how everything was going, what that would have meant 
and what A&M could have potentially done. Now, I think maybe most of us trust the defense to get a stop if that's ultimately what would have happened. But like Caleb Downs said, no, like we're not even going to chance it. And even later on that drive, too, um, he had a pretty big third down tackle at the two yard line to stop the A&M tight end from potentially scoring as well. Like that was, you know, good play in the moment, but pretty big play in hindsight, being able to get Smith out of bounds on that play. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that was, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I was standing on the sidelines uh, during that. I was standing right behind uh, Miss Terry and, you know, there was not panic, but I mean, there was just, there was like, when he initially scored, there was definitely some fear about what was happening. And then a lot of excitement when it was ruled that he stepped out and, you know, we can, I mean, there's, I'm sure a separate A&M podcast that has probably gotten into a lot of Jimo Fisher's decisions, but him kind of turtling up there and going for the field goal instead of going for the touchdown, I think, you know, made that play worth even more. The fact that they, he wasn't aggressive and was willing to just take a 20 yard field goal instead of, you know, trying to go in for, for the touchdown. So, I mean, just they, that whole kind of strategy down there was a bit confounding to me, but again, there's, I'm sure some, AM podcasts out there right now and they're hammering that point uh so we'll leave that to them i did check the uh gigum 247 board um the morning after the game and that was not a happy bunch they are not yeah. <laughs> they're not too thrilled with jimbo fisher after this game um what was one thing you did not like about the way the defense played well i'm gonna kind of i feel like use almost a little bit of a loophole here uh in my answer so i'll say what i did not like was was malachi Moore getting hurt and Same. what that could mean you know, big picture for this group. I think he's really important. I think he's obviously a veteran leader on that team. Uh, you know, to be determined, I think we'll probably get an update uh, on Monday from from Nick Saban, and we'll see what that means for him moving forward. I, I don't. Saban was, I would say, more vague than usual. Uh, just basically referred to it as a twisted ankle. You know, I ended up tweeting out something of him, you know, leaving the stadium on crutches and with the, a boot on his foot. And so we'll see what that long term is. It could be, you know, I think best case scenario, maybe a couple of weeks. We'll, we'll see. Um, but I do think there was a drop off uh, in that secondary after he went out. I think Nick Saban even acknowledged it after the game, just, you know, just in part because of Malachi's position and, and what he does, taking him out. You, know, you got to shift some guys around, shift some responsibilities, and, and that creates some challenges. So. Uh, you know, again, I don't think it'll be a massive problem against uh, against Arkansas. But I think if if he were unfortunately to be out multiple weeks and then you get into Tennessee and then, I mean, worst case scenario, LSU, I think that could be a real big problem. So you always at this kind of stage of the season, you're trying to just escape without major injuries. And, you know, they've been fortunate for the most part and being able to do that. But but Malachi would be would be a big loss. And so you're, you're just hoping that. Uh, you know, when they checked him out yesterday and given in a couple of days that it's not uh, a massive problem, but we'll find out more soon. Yeah, no, I, I, that was my answer. Um, did not like that Malachi Moore got hurt. Um, you know, I thought, I thought in the moment they did fine switching around, like they moved Terry and Arnold to star brought in Trey Amos um, things for the most part settled down quite a bit, but you know, long-term, you know, I think, you know, again, and I don't, I haven't looked too much into Arkansas yet, but I know obviously KJ Jefferson's a guy who's, you know, an experienced quarterback. Um, Got to think Sam Pittman's probably drawing up some plays to try and target Trey Amos right away next Saturday, right? Like they're going to probably try and test that guy. They know what they've gotten Kool-Aid. They know what they've gotten Terry and Arnold, um, you know, makes you wonder if Alabama will shift anything. We're presuming that Moore is probably not going to play in this game. I think given what Arkansas has shown so far, maybe, you know, this, go ahead and just take the game off, right? Get healthy, try and get back for Tennessee. Cause then you got a bye week before LSU. So, yep. you know, not to try and push it, but you know, if it is, you know, twisted ankle, we're maybe thinking sprained or highly sprained ankle, um, you know, take this week to get healthy and try to make the comeback for Tennessee because that's, you know, I may not be a believer in Joe Milton, but Josh Heupel's a really good offensive mind. And, you yep. know, you want to have your secondary in tip top shape for a game like that. So, you know, yeah, I thought in the moment they did the Alabama secondary did fine making the shift, but long term, um, I think you'd rather have Malachi more than not have him. No, um, no. In your mind, what was the play of the game? I really liked the way that Jalen Milrow bounced back when he, you know, I thought did a really good job handling the pressure and then just missed a pretty wide open Jermaine Burton uh, in the end zone. And I think a lesser quarterback would have let that 
bleed over into the next play and a, a lesser leader would have let that team just sag after a play like that. And I think the way that he bounced back very next play, a much harder throw um, in a much tighter window. And somehow he delivered it right on the money for a touchdown. Uh, again, I think speaks to the entire Jalen Miller experience, um, play to play, <laughs> but I just thought, it, I mean, it was a, you know, you were talking about, you know, blue chip players make blue chip plays. Like, I, I don't know how I, I mean, it was just, it was a big time throw in a big time moment, you know? And I think that he showed, Hey, I've got this in my bag when I need it and I can deliver this. And that he's done that a few times now this season where you think, you know, maybe we're underrating Jalen Milrow as a passer, especially, you know, we all just talk about how much of an athlete he is, but you know, that Texas play, there's just a few plays in some of these games where it's like, that's like a legit throw right there that not a lot of guys can make. So I was very impressed by that. It was obviously an important moment um, for them to, to get that touchdown. And I think put a, a a big role in why they won so that to me just just that back-to-back play um for for Milrow, i thought was huge yeah no that was that was great i think the, the so the play before that right that second and 14 um he had burton open like in the flat but i think also in re-watching it like you know burton's open because like it was a broken play right everybody kind of yeah. had to adjust their routes a little bit and Milro milrose you know kind of rolling to his left milrose open or not milrose burton's open um but then also for like a split second as milrose looking downfield Dupre is open in the end zone and so i wonder if like you know milrose thinking you know let's let's see if we can fire it deep here and just in the midst of seeing Dupre open for a second seeing burton open he just kind of like threw it between them yeah, you know, as opposed to like, yeah, as opposed to like picking one or the other, he's just kind of like that direction. Like, I'll let's try just see both. what happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whereas then, like you know, on the next play, all he's looking at is Burton after the you know he's got a you know I think he starts with a slant and then comes cuts back out. All Miro's looking at is Burton, and he mm-hmm. just like I don't know that he could have thrown that pass any better. Like, I mean, he literally like he just he just put it in the bread basket. It was really impressive. Yeah. Um, you know, and that was also like that was during a stretch where. You know, I, you talk about underrating Milrow maybe a little bit as a passer. He started the second half five for five, um, had a stretch where he went like 13 of 17 in the second half. Like really good stuff, like especially in that that third quarter. Um, you know, I wrote this in the rewatch. Please go read it it's on Bama 247. Um, not a lot of 12 personnel in the first half, and they only had 148 total yards of offense, uh, ran 12 plays in 12 personnel in the third quarter and 149 yards. So you know, maybe this game maybe wasn't the most ringing endorsement for 12 personnel, but like clearly it helped open up a few things for the offense, um, you know, or at least the implementation of it obviously helped the offense get in a groove a little bit. Uh, point being, Alabama's better offense with another tight end on the field. But yes, um, Jayla Miller, I thought was he had a lot of really good moments. It was impressive. I think the uh, play of the game for me, I'm going to take the I, I love the Caleb Downs pick. Even Saban said that that kind of changed the momentum of the game back to Alabama side, but um, the back-to-back sacks for the safety, like that to me was just like the defense and more specifically the defensive line just saying like, we need a play and we're going to be the dudes to do it. And they just boom, boom, like, and it was just the fact that it was exclusively the defensive line guys. Like you think Turner Braswell when you think sacks and, you know, pressure on the opposing quarterback, like that was Keenan and Otis and then Justin Aboigby. And it was just really impressive how they were able to get that done you know, quite literally instantaneously. So thought that was really good. Who is your game MVP? I think, uh, I mean, I think Milrow is the obvious one, um, but I think, you know, some variation of Milrow, Burton, or Caleb Downs to me are the three that stand out. Um, So if I were to do, I'll break it down and I'll cheat a little bit here. I'll give, Burton, my offense of MVP, and then I'll give uh, Caleb my defensive MVP. Um, just because I think I picked Milrow last week, so I want to mix it up a little bit. But it's the answer is honestly probably Milrow, and I'm probably galaxy branding this a little bit here. Um, but <laughs> I'm just trying to trying to mix it up a little bit. No, I think that's fair. I'll I'll go you know Downs co MVP, and then also Burton. Um, I guess what I and this maybe leads into the the last thing that we'll talk about here, which is like a question that we have moving forward. Um, you know, can, can Burton, can, can Burton do this consistently? You know, can they, can, can him and bond more specifically? Like that was kind of my question moving forward. Like I'll give Burton the MVP for this game. It was a career day, nine catches, 197, two touchdowns, had a false start and an unsportsmanlike, like, 
you know, also had a drop, also had a fumble. Like it was a little bit of a roller coaster day for Burton, all things considered. But he came up in the big moments when they needed him. They clearly designed the game plan around him beating, um, you know, A and M's cornerback DeBerry. Um, believe of his of his catching total, uh, five catches for 145 yards against DeBerry, poor cornerback yeah. from A and M. Um, you know, like clearly it, it, the offensive game plan was designed for deep shots, and yeah. and Burton came through, which was good. Uh, but I guess, yeah, to kind of transition into the next portion of this podcast, like what question do we have moving forward? That's my one question. Like, are are these, you know, Benson, Burton and Bond, are those the three primary receivers moving forward? Um, you know, if Alabama has to lean on the deep passing game again, can Burton, you know, nine, one ninety seven and two touchdowns is a lot to ask every single single game. But like, can you be a steady, consistent guy, you know, in the passing game for Alabama? Like, can you be that alpha receiver that we've been asking about that maybe they've been hunting for a little bit through the first few games. Like maybe this is the game where they settle on those three guys and everybody else will rotate in to give them breathers now and again. But um, you know, Burton for my offensive or co MVP, but then also like, that's my biggest question. Like, can you continue to do this moving forward? You've shown that, you know, you can be a productive receiver just based on what you did last year, but you know, coming into this game and I know he's been dealing with a foot injury he only had, I think, like eight catches, 189 yards and two touchdowns. And then he literally doubles his season long output in one game. Like, I want to see you do that, you know, not to that extent every week, but like, I want to see you consistently be that alpha receiver every single game. That's my question moving forward. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's been, I think the receivers have been probably my, uh, my pet project all, all year. That's just been the thing that I've been so fascinated by. And, you know, I can think back to, you know, last year getting baited into thinking it might be Ja'Cory Brooks or some of these other guys. And so, you know, I'm not fully, I'm not a full believer yet, but I do think that Burton has a lot of the attributes that you want. And we've seen enough on film now and actual on field production to believe it, it should be him. And so, yeah, I want to see, can, can he build off of that? And I think for me, you know, the, mentioned it earlier but i'm really curious about what is the offensive line combination that they decide to go with it is it are we going to be switching guys around all season are they going to eventually lock in um i mean even what they're doing um at the left tackle position you know still kind of rotating those guys in a little bit it seems pre-planned um is is that just what it's going to be all season i mean that feels a little weird to me um or eventually is it just one or the other so i think you know i think we know that Booker and and obviously JC are, are locked in. Uh, Seth seems locked in. I don't think there's really another option, though. I know fans probably wouldn't wouldn't mind seeing there be some competition at the center position. But beyond that, I mean, it's like you got Ferguson, Dalcourt, Roberts. I mean, I, I don't think I was even thinking much about Roberts before he played in this game, um, which was was obviously really interesting. And then again, Pritchett and, and Proctor have been in a battle all season, so. That's that's kind of a, the, the back half of the season. That's one of the things that I'm really interested in. Is just like, can they can they get that group? Because it's you know for it, it matters with continuity. You know, I think that the fact that you know um, you know Roberts had those two false starts at the end. I'm not putting it solely on that, but you know, if guys don't play a lot together, I think it leads to more issues that you just don't know each other as well. You don't trust each other. You don't know. All right, I know in this situation this guy's going to do this because I've seen him do it hundred times in games they just don't have that yet and so i think you know at some point that they're going to have to figure that out and personally i think robert said enough in this game even with the false starts uh, to be the guy this week and so we'll see you know saban mentioned dalcourt dealing a little bit of a shoulder injury we'll see uh, who gets to start against arkansas but i think that the roberts and then proctor at the left tackle spot i think that's probably the winning combination in my eyes at least from what we've seen so far yeah, I think at least, you know, I, they seem to have a lot of options, which can be good because like, you know, you got a lot of pieces you can use. But to what to your point, like they can also be bad because when it comes to offensive line continuity, I think is a really important thing, yeah. you know, so like, you know, you've got, you know, I wonder if, you know, if Dalcourt comes back, do they do they try subbing him in at center? I don't know if it makes any difference, but the previous two seasons, he did beat McLaughlin out to be the starting center before injuries ultimately, you know, forced McLaughlin back into the starting role. Yep. Um, Terrence Ferguson, I know is a guy that they like and a guy that played has played really well in his limited snaps. He got the start against South Florida. I thought he played really well then. Um, we'll see what happens with left tackle. I'm assuming that it's going to be Caden Proctor, who's at least going to get the majority of the snaps. It looks like they're going to keep this rotational thing for a while, but you know, now Roberts emerges as, you know, a dude that maybe they can plug into guard for you know 
right guard I, books pretty much got left guard, you know, nailed down, but yeah, there's, I, there's a lot of pieces here and, you know, I, I think it's that that'll be an interesting subplot to follow. You know, what are they, how are they going to use it? What are they going to do? Are they just going to settle on a five? Is Dalcor just going to get plugged back in as soon as he's good to go? Um, they got some pieces. So I, which I guess is encouraging, but also like continuity, I think is an important thing. That is, I, that's the most part, you know, that's Alabama's win. They're five and one now, three and oh, top the SEC West all alone, despite all the wacky, weird, inconsistent play that we've seen through the first few weeks. Um, we missing anything else? Do we got any final thoughts on this game? No, that's it. I mean, a win's a win, you know. Um, that's the most important thing. And like you said, they're they're in the driver's seat of the SEC West right now. You know, as much as there was panic after Texas and South Florida, this team is is in a good position. You know, I, I had thought they were gonna lose one of Texas and Texas AM. Um, they obviously lost Texas, they beat Texas AM. I think they're kind of, you know. Where they are right now is where I expected. I don't know if I would have said that I've expected this journey to this point. Uh, it's been a little, uh, it's been some, you know, kind of weaving around. Um, but I think they're at the point where they need to be right now. And so now it's taking care of business. You know, you got to beat Arkansas. I, I would like to see a more comprehensive effort against Arkansas. I would like to see a game in which it does not come down to the last drive. You know, I think that's, I think we'd like to see that from, a quality opponent they did mississippi state i think arkansas they need to do that again and then you know setting into what is a really important stretch you know tennessee by then lsu um i think that could really go a long way in terms of determining you know where where their ceiling is for the season so i'm just you know midway through the year i'm just fascinated to see what we're going to get the rest of the way yeah um and i think you know the I, i'm interested to just see what's going to happen because this is one of those teams again you just don't really know what's going to happen, um, yep. you know, or at least you don't know how the game is going to go. You might feel confident that Alabama is probably going to win, but how they arrive to that final score um, is at least one of the more interesting parts um, of, of this team on a week to week basis. I will say, though, there's something to be said about um, taking care of business at the end of the day. There's something to be said about going on the road in front of 100,000 plus people and getting a win over a team that matchup wise I mean, a team that's one, very, very good, just with a lot of talent on the roster, but two, matchup wise, like it does not necessarily favor you. So the fact that they were able to go in and beat, you know, a pretty good AM team, um, I thought that that was impressive. Um, bigger test still away. You mentioned Tennessee, you know, once November hits, it's LSU, it's on the road at Kentucky, which looks like to be a pretty good team. I know they got housed by Georgia, but, um, you know, that's, that's another road test against another yeah. team that is playing very well this season. Then obviously they got to finish up at Auburn. So, um, Still plenty of tests for this Alabama team, but so far um, they're playing pretty well. They they control their own destiny, and if they continue to take care of business, they will be playing in Atlanta in early December. And I think if you told people that after the South Florida game, they would have called you crazy, but yet yeah. here they are still doing the damn thing um, here in the first week of October. John, I appreciate you coming on with me, as always, to recap these Alabama games. Um, they are entertaining, if nothing else, that's for sure. Absolutely. Uh, that is all we've got today, guys. We appreciate you tuning in. We'll be back later this week to recap the news of the week and look ahead to Alabama's game against Arkansas. That is an 11 a.m. kick this next Saturday at Brian Denny Stadium in Tuscaloosa. I believe it's homecoming for the Crimson Tide, so um, should be a fun little celebration there throughout the week. In the meantime, be sure to rate and review the show wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify, even our Bama 247 YouTube page. Subscribe to Bama 247 and 247 Sports. Guys, I believe you can get a subscription now. We're still running a special, a dollar a month to start and just $10 a month uh, thereafter for the best coverage of your favorite college football team. Take advantage of that, especially if you're an Alabama fan. Thank you so much again for listening, you guys. We will talk again soon.